for security as part of their job. Okay, okay cool. Um, so I'm going to spend a little less time on the super technical bits of that, um, and I'll spend a little bit more time on the basic pieces of what these libraries do and how you can use them. Um, who would call themselves a beginning programmer? Absolute beginner. Okay, intermediate and advanced. And too cool to raise your hand. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> See, I made you raise your hand. See, you thought you were too cool. I got you. I was going to do intermediate, and then you went instantly to advanced. So. Got you. Okay, so I'm going to sit down and do this. Um, I'm going to try to speak up really loud, but let me know. Um, I'm Ashley. I do forensics. Um, don't be a jerk with what I'm showing you. Some of this stuff can be used for um, shady purposes, so don't be shady. Um, if you like this talk, there is my Twitter handle. I post other talks and sometimes research. Um, if you really, really like this talk, we can talk about research and collaboration and job stuff afterwards. And if you think of a question, email me. Do not spam me. Um, we are going to talk about a couple of challenges and considerations for people who develop tools for Python uh, for forensics. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about imaging, um, and you'll see why that's important here. Um, what files we want, how we get memory, how we get locked files, um, and what resources are available. If you want to learn a little bit more about this. Um, and also we will have a fight to the death over Vim or Emacs. Um, I think we all pretty much know what's going on. So um, it is a little bit the wild, wild west in forensics development. And the reason why I say that is there are <laughs> a lot of things that you can't really control. So first of all, my tools have to run on somebody else's piece of crap computer. It's not going to be my beast of a development machine, ever. Uh, that would be nice. But memory man management is challenging. You have to mod function sometimes. Um, locked files, the operating system of Windows in particular, um, you have journaling file systems. There's a lot of files that are constantly being written to, and we can't just say, give me all the things, and they'll just come to you. So either they're hidden, and you can't unhide them. Um, it would be bad to unhide them anyways. Um, or they're just not able to be pulled. Or there's alternate data streams, so lots of data going into a file from many different places at the same time. Um, encryption, so sometimes things will be locked up because it's <coughs> encrypted, and you get to try to either decrypt that or ask very nicely for a key, which you might not get. Um, and then there aren't very many open source suites. I will give credit to a couple, um, Libyal, Yoakam Metz's tools. There's a lot of them, they're awesome. Uh, volatility, Recall, those are a couple other ones to note. Um, but in general, there are a lot of spin-offs, just one-shot one cool tools that we like, but they're one-offs. They often aren't documented great, so you have to rely on your debugger and just simple things like dict in the Python language to say what's inside of this tool, what, what's available to me. Um, there's constantly changing operating system features too, so every new release of an operating system gives me new things that I have to care about. Every patch gives me new things that I might have to care about. So it's not like there's a tidy, nice list that Microsoft releases every time there's a patch release that says what is affected by this change. That would be nice. Um, and then also you need to know more than just Python. Um, typically, well, a lot of these tools, I won't say all of them, but a lot of them uh, are originally C or C++, and there's a Python binding. So it's not just straight up Python. If somebody asks you what this thing does, you can't just say, oh, well, I put in the Python function and it does something. You have to know what the C does as well. Um, we have to answer, how does it work? Frequently, people will ask us, how does it work? And they'll scrutinize why we're doing something a certain way. Um, collection of files has to be forensic. So that means I can't change a bunch of stuff when I'm going around somebody's computer. Um, it, I have to make as little footprint as possible. And that kind of leads into this next slide. Every time you run a tool on a live machine, you change something. The tool is loaded into memory. Some, some journal somewhere will, will, will track it. If you're exporting files or copying files, maybe that'll show up on the MFT, um, master file table. Uh, there's event logs. And yeah, the tool is loaded into memory. It's very important. The tool is loaded into memory. So it's a problem. Um, I'm going to talk about imaging really quick. Um, brownie points to anybody who knows what that computer is. Um, 
Watson's goal in life is to play chess with that guy. Um, no, uh, it's okay. What is Watson? So it's, an, it's an IBM computer. They're testing it by playing chess. Just the Indian beginning. I want to check it. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> uh, we'll check the checkers. Um, We're just too young to know this. It's okay. Younger than you. <laughs> um, so with imaging, I just talked about this so you have some context for what I'm going to talk about next. So. Imaging, we're basically making a copy of something. We're copying the computer. We're, co no, we're copying the computer. We're cloning the computer. Um, we're copying the entire disk. We're copying a logical drive. We're copying a couple of files. But basically, imaging means we're making a copy. Um, there's argument over whether it should be done live or dead. Um, I say it depends on whether it's a spinning disk or a solid state drive, whether it's locked or not. Um, and then whether you have the time to sit there for an hour while somebody's entire drive copies, when that might not be necessary. How long do you think it'll take to copy this computer that has uh, 16 gigs of RAM and 500 storage? Just ballpark, how long do you think it takes to copy this whole thing? USB 2 or storage? USB 3. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that, that matters. That matters. That matters. <laughs> USB 3 is faster than 2. Um, so with 2, how, how long does it take? <laughs> no. Isn't a point of the question? It takes Steve a while. Gibson's four boot disk. I'm going to go with four hours. <laughs> it <laughs> takes a while. Sorry, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> four thousand seconds. Four thousand okay. seconds. Four thousand seconds. It, it takes a while, um, and it can take hours to image a server. It can take days to image a server, and you don't really have that kind of time usually if you're responding to something. Um, so we don't actually want all the things usually. We we want a couple things. Um, SANS calls it triage imaging, um, so I'll attribute triage imaging to SANS. Um, but this isn't a, a super new concept, right? Just get the things that you need to do the investigation. So we care about system files, typically. We care about memory. Um, we care about user activity files. It depends on what you're looking at. Like, if I think somebody is watching dirty movies at work, do I care about, you know, their documents where they're doing their taxes or something? Yeah. But do I care about their Chrome browser history or their cache there? Maybe, yes. Um, so stuff like that. It's, it changes depending on what kind of investigation you're doing, but you, there, there are different considerations you want to make. Typically, we want to get all the system files. We just do. Okay. So we talk about memory first. Why do we always get memory first? Why do we always try to copy memory first as opposed to going after files on the hard disk? It's volatile. It's volatile. That's a good word. So we do call this volatile data. Um, and it's volatile, and the suite that we use to look at it is called volatility, um, because everything you do to a computer will change memory, um, including the tool that you load. That will be loaded in memory. So the first thing you do is get memory. Pretty simple. Um, so there is an open source tool that does this when PMEM is a part of volatility or recall. Recall is Google's work with volatility. Um, there's also a bunch of commercial tools that you can use. Um, I won't plug any of them. Um, and then also PSUtil gives some useful things. Who here has used PSUtil before? Okay, cool. PSUtil or PSUtils, I see it written differently. Um, it's by Jim Paolo Rodola. Um, it's not a full or partial memory image, but it does tell me a couple of things that are that are interesting in memory. So let me get out of this guy, and we can play around with this a little bit. Um, I encourage you to check out the documentation for PSUtil. Um, I want to say. Better. Huzzah! <laughs> okay, so PSUtil. I'm just importing PSUtil and DateTime. Made a dumb little separator. Um, so here's some network things. I can see where we're connected to a network. I can see disk partitions. Um, I can also see how big they are, which sometimes is useful for me. Um, disk capacity versus used. I can get users. Um, boot times, and I can get processes. So processes are, are, are really important for us. Um, when we see malware spinning up, if we query all the processes that are running, we can see, oh, well, this isn't supposed to spin up under this parent, or this shouldn't be running on this computer at all. This looks evil. 
So, and by the way, we have probably the best reverse engineer I know in the room. With us. So, if you have questions about malware, <laughs> is this the right person to ask? Don't kill him. Um, so, I'll I'll do a quick little quick little run of this guy. And I'll show you. So we just see, you know, I've got Chrome, <laughs> got a lot of stuff running. Um, here's all my processes that are running. Um, let's go up in here. So here's internet connections currently. Um, I think I filtered this for TCP. There's a couple ways that you can filter this. You can do like, oh, I only want, I only want INET, TCP, UDP. Um, if there's a specific protocol you're looking for, there's decent documentation on how to do this. Um, Here's users, so, you know, there's me, Ashley Holtz. Um, started, you have to convert the date, so I show you how to convert the date here. It's just date time. It's a simple conversion. Um, so any questions on PSUtil and sort of what it does? Okay, silence is an indication of boredom. Yes, or, <laughs> or I'm just doing that well. You're just that awesome. I'm just that good. Let's pretend So I actually have a slight question, good. though. <laughs> um, that ran almost instantly. Yes. Uh, is that just because of your machine or? No. Like... Um, it ran instantly because I'm not querying anything that's that heavy with that. Um, mm -hmm. And also, the majority of the work for some of these utilities is being done by C or Windows APIs. Mm -hmm. um, and typically, what's going to be faster, running writing something in pure Python or writing something in C and writing a Python binding per function? Mm -hmm. Who's faster? C is faster. Why is C faster? Compiler. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, a, a lot of that is just C. A lot of that is I'm not doing anything that crazy with it. Um, I will show you something a little bit more memory intensive that will take a yeah. sec to run. So I'm going to switch computers over here. So does PSU kill um, library cover pretty much everything that's in the PSU? Um, not necessarily. Um, basically, like for, for what I use it for, I really only care about processes that network connections with it. Um, but there's a lot of like CPU times and stuff yeah. like that. It covers that too. Um, yeah. um, Does PSUtil do much to the existing memory? Um, PSUtil must doesn't do much to the existing memory, does it? It doesn't. It doesn't change a lot, but it will show execution of running. Like when you open up a command line and just do like IP config or something like that, you'll still see a slight like, oh, that was run. Um, a similar footprint would happen. PS Util, you're just querying system information. So you're not really executing a write on anything. So it's a fairly clean tool to run. But I would still collect the memory before I run something like that. Okay, so we are going to... Now we've talked about memory a little bit. Um, I mentioned operating system locked files. Um, and this is where the good stuff in Windows lies. So I'm talking mainly about um, the master file table, and I'm talking about the change journals. There's an operating system change journal, um, and, and there's a, a file, like a user change journal. Um, and there's a couple ways that you can get these. There's one that's a little Hackintosh, um, which I'll show you. I don't recommend this, but we, we can do this. There's actually a stand the blog on this. <laughs> um, so more on the pen testing side, um, you want to do this, and you don't want to do all the crazy PyTSK stuff, then you know this is an option. Um, we could use a volume shadow snapshot. Who knows what a volume shadow snapshot is? Okay, cool. So you know those restore points that you can roll your Windows computer back to? Those are snapshots. So what it does is it doesn't make a copy of the, every file on your disk. It takes note of which blocks have changed. A little different, but they're pretty easy to reassemble, um, and there's a lot of libraries that do it. So, volume sh shadow snapshots, fairly accessible way to get a file at a snapshot in time. So this could be interesting to me if I think he stole something like a month ago, and I have a volume shadow snapshot. They run at a fairly regular interval if it's unmodified. I think Windows 7 runs every Wednesday night or something like that, um, but typically admins just for space considerations will disable this. Um, which is a shame, but I'll show you how to force it to make one. Um, it's not forensic to create a volume shadow snapshot of right now, because if I wanted to know what the master file table looks like right now, I could just create a volume shadow snapshot right now and then just export that file. Why is that a little janky to do? Is making a restore point a big change or a little change? A big hunk and change. It, it's, it's a big change. Um, so we really 
don't encourage you to do this, but I felt like I should talk about it just because you can. So, yeah, let me get rid of some of this trash here. Let's go over here. So, there's a tool in Windows called VSS Admin. You can tell that I ran it earlier today. So, I'm running as admin right now, um, just in a command. So, it's an elevated command prompt. Uh, I just typed in VSS Admin. These are my options. Uh, VSS Admin list shadows. This will tell me all the volume shadow snapshots that exist on this machine. I created two yesterday um, while preparing for the talk, so you'll see two there. Um, if I wanted to do this manually, I could go create a restore point. Create a restore point. Yeah. It's off. I can't hit OK. I can't configure it or anything because some admin has disabled it. This will not be on GitHub. So just, you know, if you, if you want to do this, yeah, don't blame me if anything goes wrong. Remember the, well, <laughs> don't you, be a jerk. I pledge to not be a jerk. Everybody's saying this, but okay, don't be a jerk. So we can use Win32.com uh, and we can call up WMI and we can use the create parameter on the shadow copy service. And I can point it at the C drive. Oh no! It breaks. Um, so this should have worked, worked yesterday. <laughs> I, have, I changed my Python install from 64 bit to 32 bit, so I have a feeling that that's what I did this today. So that's lame. But, anyways, here's how you would do it in Python if you're going to do this. Fail! Attack with swords. Okay, so um, within the volume shadow copies, though, there's a name. It says volume shadow, co shadow copy volume something 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 slash hard disk volume shadow copy one so I'm going to go let me go into view so everybody can actually see this hello presentation mode there we go so we can just use basic OS this was the path from VSS Admin to one of the volume shadow copies. So there's two that I have. So one, and then I did slash dollar sign MFT. So this is the master file table, um, one of those operating system locked files. Um, I'm using Unicode here, so I'm escaping these slashes. You could also use what letter instead of U, R, to escape things. So I would I would use raw R, um, and and you can use plus slashes. I just I felt like Unicode that day. Um, so I just did OS path is file and it's true. So it does exist and I can access these files and then I could read this like any other file and copy it or whatever if I wanted to. Um, so yeah, if I know where the volume shadow copy is, I know that it was done on a good date or I created it today because I'm an awful hacker. Um, you know, there, there's that. Um, I'll introduce you to a slightly better way to do this though. Um, I'm going to introduce this library called PyTSK. Um, who here has heard of the sleuth kit? Okay, so security guys, basically. <laughs> um, I have a question about the volume snapshot. Yeah, sure. So, are, is it possible that they could be manipulated in some way, or like, is there a way to like edit those things? Uh, so, if you knew that your computer was going to get taken, and there's a way to figure that out, like, well, yeah. Um, anything on a computer can be manipulated, right? Like anything on a computer can be changed. If somebody wants to change it, they can. Um, with volume shadow copies especially, um, I've been able to go into mine and delete specific files, but it showed up on my USN journal. So, you know, it's give and take. So then I would have to go to my USN journal and modify it, but then the USN journal would show that I modified it. And then, you know, so, so you really have to know. That's why utilities, um, like disk wipe utilities, we can tell when they've run they leave something behind. They might delete a few things. They might try to overwrite registries and stuff like that. But there's always something, especially with a journaling file system, you'll have something tracking what you're doing. So you just have to decide where the final endpoint is going to be. Okay, cool. Thanks. But yeah, they, they are manipulable, definitely. Um, everything on a computer is. So these libraries, PyTSK, uh, I need a 32-bit machine. So I'm just using struct to shoot. 30, not 32-bit machine, 32-bit Python, which is why I changed this today. Um, so I'm just going to check this with struct. Just simple. 
Um, so yeah, I know that I'm running 32-bit, fine. So now I'm going to get into the meat of the presentation. It's probably going to be the coolest thing that I'm going to show you today. You know, considering I show you so many cool things already. Super cool. Um, so PyTSK is the Python binding for the sleuth kit. Also, we have Metz um, and, and a few other contributors, I believe, but he's the main one that I remember, so his name gets mentioned on the presentation. Um, great library. What the Swift kit does is it basically dumps the raw contents of that file, builds nodes, and then allows us to parse through them. This is very powerful because it's not opening the file and copying it, it's dumping the contents of the file. So basically getting, giving me zeros and ones, or hex, or something, and it's giving me that piece of the file, if that makes sense. Um, I can go into the how a little bit more later if you're interested, but anyways, I have PyTSK3 loading. Um, I'm just using OS. We're going to open the drive. We just use image info to open the drive. We open up the file system, and then we open up the file. This is the basic structure of a PyTSK call. So open the image, because you could use a logical or physical drive. You could also use an image um, if you open it correctly. So Yokomets also has libraries that will use a volume shadow snapshot. They will also be able to open BitLocker encrypted volumes. We can get expert witness file, EO1s, um, and, and there's several others, QCOW2, um, uh, DISDUMP, and, and RAW will also work on this as well. So it's, the syntax changes slightly, which I'll show you with volume shadow snapshots in a minute. But anyways, so file system info, this builds a node for me, and then the file entry is what I'm actually looking at for the MFT. Then I'm just going to create a destination file, so this is where the heavy... I'm going to change a lot of stuff on this computer because I'm going to create a file. This is where I'm not being forensic anymore. Up until this point, I have been forensic. Okay, so I'm just looking for something and I'm opening it. Here I'm creating a file. If you wrote it out to an external drive, how forensically unforensic is that? <laughs> <laughs> it's slightly more forensic, but still unforensic. <laughs> it's slightly more forensic. Um, slightly. In general, we try not to create new files on the computer that we're trying to copy stuff from. So typically, I would run this from a USB drive, or I would do this over a network or something like that. Um, so yes, we will never be perfectly forensic, but yeah. yeah. Do you typically take out the hard drive and then do this maybe? Um, that depends. Would I take out the hard drive if this was a solid state drive? What happens when you power off a solid state drive? The cache is dead. Mm. So, so why though? There's write leveling, right? So solid state drives will flip things back in place. And basically, it changes un it changes unallocated space. It changes a lot of things. And also, what happens when you pull power on a computer? Do you still have memory? You have like hibernation files and stuff, maybe. But eh, yeah, typically, I would be running this on a lab machine. Um, we wouldn't care so much about changing files on an image, though, right? Because we have an image, we already have a copy of the entire drive, and it doesn't matter. But this is if we're just pulling it from a live system. That's a good question, though. Um, so I've opened and created a destination file. I'm being a bad, bad girl right now. Um, so then I can just iterate through the file entry. The file entry has attributes. So adder is my abbreviation here for attributes. And this is almost straight out of the documentation for PyTSK. Um, I'm looking for NTFS data. There are different attributes inside of this file entry. You know, those would be metadata, things like that. So I really only want the NTFS data attribute here. I'm dealing with Windows, I'm dealing with NTFS, so that's why I know what I, it's type 128 if you're a nerd like me. Um, but there's a nice mask for this because you know, it was nice. Um, I'm going to start at offset zero. This is the relatives offset within the file. So I'm starting at offset zero within the file, not offset zero on the disk. Because if I'm starting at offset zero on the C drive, what does that mean? Right. On the C drive. Oh. The physical drive, yes, you're correct there. But on the logical on the logical volume, I actually don't know if WTF is there, right? Um, well, it could depending on how it's configured. But anyways, um, we can query the size. And then while the offset is less than the size, read some stuff. I'm using a block size of 4 times 1024, 1024. Um, the block size matters when you care about how much you're pulling into memory. So this is a very powerful computer, very fast computer. I can do a bigger block size than this. But basically going to read the file in chunks and then export it. Why don't I load the entire file into memory? 
and then just write it to a file. Might not have enough memory, especially with a master file table that can get over gig. Um, who knows the hard and fast Python limit for how much memory you can carry on a thread? <laughs> not not from the C, not not from C, but just Python itself. It's a like completely screw you amount. That's that's all you really need to know. <laughs> um, it, it, it's not it, it's not huge. It's not big enough to carry some of these files. Um, I think I finally had it crap out at like a five gig USN journal, but I was only reading half. But anyways, um, yeah, it's you never know how much memory is available on your machine. So that's why we read in blocks. Um, <coughs> we use. This TSK method, file entry read random. So we're reading from the offset. We're reading this amount available to read. So 4 times 1024, or the size minus the offset, whichever smaller. Um, we're doing adder info type, which would be the NTFS data type. And the adder info ID, each attribute has an ID as you iterate through them. So file entry could have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and only attribute 4 is NTFS data. That's the one that we're going to read. So it needs these basic arguments to read and as we read we have data and we write the data to the destination file. I'm going to print the offset as we're doing this. Not a hard and fast requirement but I'm just going to show you how big the blocks are and where it's reading and then we close the file and then you can optionally put break. It's not necessary but eh, whatever. I'll put it in there. Um, Basically, I've already found the NTFS data attribute, and unless there's alternate data streams to care about, I don't want to read anymore. So that's why I can break there. Um, who knows what an alternate data stream is, by the way? What's an alternate data stream? It's like a file that you can't access. Yeah, it's like bonus stuff. Back in the day, on Mac, there was the Mac Mini Mac Mini Mac Mini Mac So yeah, it's basically like getting a toy at the bottom of your cell box. There's extra information inside of the file. Um, malware. Malware! <laughs> Always malware. There's nothing else in an ADS you need to care about. <laughs> no, the dollar's like J and the dollar's like Max inside of the USN journal. It's all malware, don't believe her. Everything's malware. <laughs> Everything's malware. <laughs> it's all evil and all bad. That's all I'm going to tell you. So what, what happens when you can't read this? You just can't read the disk. How big is the hole? <laughs> it causes a rift in the universes. <laughs> and we all go through a black hole. How does this library handle failure to read the disk? Um, it would just fail, or you could like you could handle it and move on. You could yeah, you could move on. But if you have a hole in the disk, no, no, I'm talking. You have a much bigger problem, don't <laughs> no, you? No, I mean, well, you're, you're saying your block size is going to be you're reading on a four meg chunk, right? So if there's any error in that four meg, you just created a hole that's four meg in size. Yes. At least. Mm -hmm. In, so inside there. It doesn't look like it's going to go back to resize the block or re, or re it. So. Right. Um, and, and that's important too, especially like when reading um, ADS inside of a journal file. There's stuff like that that I see. Um, or I'll have a bunch of slack space in files. So sometimes I have to write special handling for slack space. Um, but yeah, if you have just a giant hole or like a failure on the, on the drive itself, one, you have a bigger problem than this. Two, um, you, this is not correcting for this. I'm just so failure to read, period. I mean, yeah, you're not going to have reason. You're just going to have a forming block that's okay. trash, basically. So when you go run your TV works MFT parser against mm -hmm. this, you're like, no. So basically, read all the offsets. This went relatively quick. Um, usually, the bottleneck is opening the file or opening the file system. Usually it'll take a couple of seconds. On average, I get about three seconds to open a file entry. So if I'm recursing the entire disk, you can see how that's going to take a while. Um, so if anybody wants to speed that up in the open source community, no takers. Um, anything interesting in the registry? <coughs> yeah, there's lots of interesting stuff in the registry. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Gold mine. Gold mine. Dominique puts in the registry that she likes about malware. There's malware in the registry too, there's by the way. The I will tell you. <laughs> but there's also yummy goodness about malware, how it ran, where it went, how it's starting. Who ran? Registry is happiness. You can tell to start always with the computer. Always <laughs> little cats on your screen, always. I just do that to Ashley though. Yeah. That's true.
She's she gets startup candies every day. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so a sister to Pi TSK is Pi V Shadow. Same same author. Um, Pi V Shadow just gives us a way to access volume shadow snapshots as volumes, and then we can read files from them the same way that we would read from just the running disk. Um, so I'm going to open my C drive still. I'm going to create a V Shadow volume. So creating a volume, opening the C drive. Let's look at the stores that we have. So. Here. So here's some fluids of stores and creation dates. So yesterday, maybe this morning, 121? Oh, God, I don't sleep. Um, so yeah, I've, I've iterated through my volume shadow snapshots. So this is how I would say, oh, well, I want all of them, or I can see the data was created. So maybe if I was writing a tool, I would say, give the user, you know, I only want volume shadow snapshots that were created before this date and time, and then get the MFT from those. So you can, you can use the information in these. Nicely, so I'll just call, you know, comment this guy out. Just wanted to show you what was there. I'm just gonna get the uh, whatever's at index one, so index zero. If you're a good programmer, uh, it also helps if I don't comment the right stuff. Okay, so I've just created a convenience class um, extending PyTSK's image info. Um, all of this code is in the documentation on PyTSK close enough um, to, to get you to this point, but I can also post some of these examples. Um, so I'm just getting stored index one, um, and then that image is going to become the argument for SFinfo. That's going to open the MFT. <coughs> it's going to create a destination file. And then here I'm, I'm reading a block size of 1024 times 1024. Um, you can make this whatever, but Okay. Um, we'll write the data as it reads in, increment the offset, and close the file, and close the vshadow volume. This isn't distinctly necessary, but it's cleaner. So we're opening the vshadow. So what's the difference between these two scripts while this is running? The first one got the MFT from where? the C drive. So from the current MFT as it stands right now, oh no! <laughs> In Porto, oh no. Open. Yeah, I have to redo the whole presentation now, I feel. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is going in there. I'm not hearing enough heckling. Um, so, so the first... Do you really want to say that? Well, <laughs> Um, so, magic, magic, what's up? So, <laughs> the first one I'm reading from the C drive, I'm reading MFT as it stands right now. This is reading it from a volume shadow snapshot that I created some time yesterday. So, as a forensic examiner, which one do I care about more? Which one do I want more? Depends, both. Um, depends, depends on, on what you're investigating and why. Yes. So, when would I want the volume shadow snapshot one? When would I want this one that I just exported? When I stole something yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I know you did something bad at 1 a.m. last night. Do I do anything good at 1 a.m. last night? Um, so they volume shadow copies. Right. So, so the other one, the live one, um, that's if I stole something right now, you know, or within like the past. She's continuously evil. You want the right now. She was only evil for a short period of time last night. You want last night. When you see the trend. Of what do you think less. Ashley is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was it was still, you know, a couple seconds to open up the file system in the file entry and then we're reading off these offsets and we're ex exporting the files. So you now let's actually look and see over here. Let's see where it's updating my Python directory. Sweet. And let me go over to my documents. So here's that MFT um, that I created. This is the export of the volume shadow and this is the one that I just created a little bit ago um, for the live running disk. Okay, so we have two shiny files um, that we just exported. And let me go back over here. So any questions on uh, PyTSK, why I use it, what it is? Has anyone used it before? Or any of these tools before? So this is all completely new. Yes, you've used it before? Shiny. Does he get updated a lot? Nope. Yeah. 
Do the multi-core machines that are in common use now offer some unique potential for, uh, for doing forensics? Uh, so much. <laughs> um, in terms of processing or in terms of... Well, like, can you capture like one of the cores and uh, set it up to watch the machine in real time? And, so... Uh, put it, and, uh, take notes in a portion of, manu of mem memory that... Is there, uh, is there some more or less standard software that lets you do that? So standard software, um, for part of your question, yes, there's, there's standard software that exists for that. Um, so in terms of just monitoring, there is a lot of active monitoring software out there. Specifically, like saying, oh, I want to point it at one core. Um, I, don't, I don't know off the top of my head who, who does that. But um, in terms of examining specific pieces um, or, or examining parts of the core or something like that, yes. Um, there, there are interesting things that we find, um, and there are interesting processing capabilities. But we can, we can talk more. I'll, I'll get through this, and we can talk after about it. Um, Ashley, I got a quick question. Yeah, what's up? So the deployment of uh, all the stuff that you've shown us so far mm -hmm. seems to be on a live system. Indeed. And what would your authentication have to be? What would your privilege level have to be? Or it doesn't matter. Um, so to run these on a live system, you need to be logged into the machine and you will get the UAC pop-up. You need to be elevated. Um, so this is why case by case you determine what you're going to use to copy files. So let's say you know the computer's already powered off, I don't have credentials or anything, I'm just going to dead disk image that and I'll copy the files there. Um, but if the computer's on and logged in, and I don't know any of the passwords, and I don't know what encryption's on there, and I see the opportunity, and I have the proper legal authorization to do that, um, I, I would rather do something like this and just go grab it. So, yeah, you, you do need to have trying to keep her out of jail. <laughs> we try. We do want her out of jail. We try. Um, we miss her greatly. So yeah, you, you do need to have um, admin for most of these tools. Hi. I, I've Hi. Been struggling, I've been struggling with when the right time to ask, I think there's no right time to ask this question. Sure. But I have, I feel like, not enough context for what we're even talking about. So okay. two questions. <laughs> you feel, feel free to defer or ignore me. Um, but what do we mean by forensics as a noun? And what do we mean by forensic as an adjective? And can you fill in like some anecdotes or something like, what are you trying to do? Why are we doing this? Absolutely. So. For forensics, as a noun, um, that is basically, so digital forensics and incident response go together. Um, we are responding to some request to grab a file. So that would be the context of me writing a tool that uses these libraries. So some company thinks that some employee has stolen IP. It's a very, very common one. Some computer has executed malware on their network, and we need to see what's running on that computer. That's where we would conduct a forensic investigation. And when people hear investigation, they think, well, maybe we're going to court, and you know, there's this long, drawn-out process. It's not necessarily true. Um, you know, maybe it's a criminal investigation, and maybe we're working with law enforcement or something like that. But oftentimes, people are much more concerned about investigating what's going on in their own company. So if you work for a large company, um, there's probably backup utilities that are backing up your computers. When you leave, what do you think we do with those? If we have reason to, we go through your crap. Shocking, mm -hmm. right? Like, I don't know about plus, what way to say that. Um, we data mine. <laughs> data mine, yeah, that's a good one. Um, there's <laughs> indicators um, of evil that, um, that, that we look for. So it's not just in the context of a police investigation, it's uh, con in the context of an internal investigation as well. Um, so we're responding to an allegation that something went wrong on this machine, and we are conducting a forensic investigation. And in order to be forensic, we have to not change the file that we're grabbing, right? Because if I'm grabbing a file that proves you did something evil, but I can't prove that I didn't change the file, how do, how do I prove that I didn't put something in there that says he's evil when he actually isn't, right? So when we're being forensic, that means that we're trying not to change as much as possible. Every tool will change something in memory. But in general, we try not to do anything to the artifacts, if at all possible. 
So we can verify artifacts and their authenticity by hashing them, things like that. But if something's continuously writing, like a change journal or the MFT, is the hash today going to be the same as the hash tomorrow in that file? No, because there's new entries that have been created in that file. So forensic, yeah, we try not to change stuff, but things will get changed on these machines. So we try our best. But does that answer your question and give a little bit more context? Yeah, thank you. I think if, if it's possible to give more detail, it'd be interesting to hear more um, detail around a particular incident. Maybe. Yeah, I, I accept bribes of beer and beer. <laughs> beer, mostly. I accept beer bribes. Um, so. If you want to hang out again, uh, the Cypherpunks United Meetup is being reignited by Jason Calloway. Um, we talk about <coughs> cryptography, and it's awesome, and you should come if you like cryptography. I think the next thing is going to be X509 certificates. Uh, it's on March 19th. We don't have a location yet. Um, awesome. And D Plazo, DFVFS, and LibYall, those are three suites uh, of tools. LibYall is the suite uh, that LibV Shadow, PyV Shadow was under. Um, DFVFS is basically a virtual file system no builder for these file systems that we're querying. Um, Windows Internals is a book. Um, that's one of the first things I think that Dominic told me to read, and I did because I'm lame. But I you should read it, it. too. <laughs> I skimmed it, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, Volatility and Recall are two memory forensic suites. Um, go play with Kali Linux is a good suggestion. There's lots of cool security and forensic tools on there. Um, don't okay, hack awesome. people, please. Without their permission. Without their permission, yeah. What's up? There's also Kane. It's also built mm -hmm. specifically for forensics. Yeah, and also, um, if you want to look at something cool, look at Tails and try to find forensic uh, forensic stuff up at that. Tails, it's pretty cool. Um, it's designed to create no artifacts, but it totally does. Um, and then if you go on Twitter, um, the hashtag DFIR, Digital Forensics and Incident Response, that's what many of us tweet under or will like tag our tweets with that. So if you want to see research that's coming out in the community, that's something that we use. Um, and I think that's it. Yeah. Sorry, that was a really lame ending. Presentation. <laughs> any any other questions? And that's the everything is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so you are basically uh, trying to copy the files. What of, what if the files are encrypted? Maybe some uh, Mac machines are uh, security uh, uh, so all files are stored encrypted. So only the login user can be uh, decrypt files and can uh, do the corresponding work. So in that case, how will you do it? So, well, <laughs> you can either ask nicely for the password or the encryption key. You can have it subpoenaed. Um, or oftentimes if it's with it. the organization, <laughs> so a company usually has a, almost like a back door to it. So if it's an organization's laptop, like this is our company laptops, there is a back door because if something happens and the employee wins the lottery and walks away and leaves all their stuff there, there's data that we need to get back to. So there's usually some kind of backdoor key or master key that you can go in and get files off of something if you really need to. And so if you do a hard drive image, a lot of the like NKs and stuff like that, they have a way to let you enter that master key to get the data back off of it. Now, if this is your girlfriend's computer and it's encrypted, then I'm staying out of it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm staying out of it too. <laughs> um, any other questions? Unless you have beer. Unless you have beer. <laughs> beer for her. How would you go about finding malware on your computer? Or would you use something else? Uh, we use a lot of things, but that's a conversation over beer. <laughs> There's a lot of things. No, no, talk, talk to us after. We'll, we'll talk to you. Because I don't want to. I don't want to take away from yeah. her presentation. <laughs> Sorry. I have some questions. That's fine. Yeah, sure. Windows machines. Yeah. Uh, have this ever one. encountered anyone trying to cover their tracks by trying to uh, impersonate the services like con libraries and stuff you're really querying? Oh, yeah. Um, people will name their malware all kinds of interesting things. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. I explore her. Yeah, I explore or, um, or things like with dots and things. Yeah, spaces. They, they get very creative. Ones instead of L's. Oh, yeah. Drivers. Yeah, dri drivers are a gold mine. Really fun way to play malware. So services that nobody uses and you use them. 
Um, yeah, so people will name them weird, or we'll see them come from like weird parents. Um, so processes that aren't supposed to spawn like 50 things, and you see it spawning 50 things, probably malware. <laughs> um, so yeah. Um, yeah. So on what you're describing, you're pulling data to find the event that you're trying to find, things that are being spawned by things that they are, they are supposed to be spawned by. To so what extent do you use additional data analysis once you've pulled information on log files or on information you've pulled to, to tick and tie information from one machine to another to try to find disparities or, or what have you to try to find the problems that you're looking for? So it's actually, um, that's sort of related to some of the research that I do with artificial intelligence and neural networks. Um, but basically, when I'm looking at a bunch of computers, um, if somebody's doing something weird on one, it's usually pretty obvious when you look at the list of processes that they're running and the list of processes that other people are running. So you can do analytics like that if you have a bunch of machines to, to look at. In general, there's a profile of what looks weird and what doesn't look weird. And a lot of antivirus will just pick that up. You don't really need a lot of big data analysis. But for a larger organization, and you have a lot of machines that you can look at um, in terms of what's loaded into memory, even in terms of how, how much memory is being taken up, a lot of malware is memory intensive. Um, you can look at number of processes that are being run. Um, you can look at who's statistically significantly weird. Um, yeah, there's a lot of tools in the market that do that right now. There's smarter, better ways to do it, but um, but yeah, we do analysis there. And then also, um, in terms of proving lateral movement throughout a network, when we're looking at logs, that's an interesting thing. You can see, oh, well, he was logged in here, and then he logged in over here, so his credentials were compromised, and then he logged in over here, so you can see that kind of like mapping, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff too. So yeah, it's a gold mine. Maybe. Well, we can talk about that over beer too. Over beer. Um, yeah. Really just, just real quick. Um, sure. In general, how long does it take to perform a thorough forensic analysis? Or what are the timers? <laughs> <Wow. laughs> Don't think until, the, until the money runs out is really the answer that we will give you. <laughs> um, because you can keep going down and down the yeah. rabbit hole. What would you like to find? And did, exactly. What do you want to like, find? What do you want me to find? Do you want to find a thing four years ago that they really were compromised four years ago and again three years ago? So you can go really far down a rabbit hole. It's just a matter of how much evidence do you need to do the thing you want to do. If you're trying to fire somebody, if you're trying to find all the indicators to find all the other malware. So it's it's that it, it depends answer, which consultants always give you. It's the only answer we ever give anybody. Yeah, so... But it, it yeah. depends on what you need out of the analysis is how long it'll take. Yeah, it can be as quick as, is this file on this person's computer? Did they copy it to a flash drive or not? Um, or it could be as crazy as, we think this person has been doing all kinds of shady crap. Tell me reasons why I can fire them. <laughs> and we've also got, so somebody came and told us that there's malware and the dates on it are four years ago. Can you tell us how they got infected four years ago? And obviously that's a much Damn. more intensive <laughs> thing. So. That's a lot of work to do. And yes, you can. But it was hard. <laughs> we know everything. <laughs> yeah. How much luck do you have convincing juries? And how often do you uh, testify if you do it all? <laughs> um. <laughs> Avoid it if at all possible. Yeah. It's really <laughs> not a lot of fun. And I don't want it to. It, ta it takes a lot of time to repair that stuff, too. Um, I, I like to code and stay in my cave. Right. So I actively avoid that. Um, but that's where we talk about it being forensic, because if we are in that situation, we have to be able to say, yes, we used a forensically sound method to do blah, 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 so what we are giving you is valid. Because everything is discoverable, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it well, depends. It depends on if you work under privilege or not. Yeah, it depends on scope. And also, sometimes it'll be, oh, well, this computer gave you access to, this person gave you access to, I call people computers, that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> This person gave you access to just their um, just their documents directory. Why were you scrolling around in their photos? Because I thought it was a shady dude. I don't know, but you, you know. So some it depends on the specific scope there, and then also it depends on whether we can say you know this is a proven method that we use to export this. The hashes match between our expert and, and their expert, or um, you know the hash of the image is the same. Only one of us collected it. Maybe you know, there, there's a lot of factors that go into credibility with, with a jury and how forensic an investigation is. Um, so, yeah. 
And also, a lot of these, um, a lot of these files, the structure is fairly well documented in older operating systems, but with some of the new artifacts, it could be original research that we conducted. And then we see it and we say, well, you know, I tried this a hundred times, and the result is always this, and he did this, and the result was this, so he must have done this. And the other expert can come back and say, well, nobody's ever said that before. It's not documented. You're crazy. So, you know, there, there's a lot that goes into it. Sorry, I was rambly. Um, anything else? All right. Okay. Thank <laughs> you.